Hi, this is Randall Schwartz, host of Floss Weekly. This week, Gareth Greenaway joins me. We're going to be talking about setting up computer labs for kids in need. You're not going to want to miss this, so stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Floss Weekly is provided by CashFly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Floss Weekly with Randall Schwartz and Gareth Greenaway. Episode 323, recorded January 28th, 2015. Kids on Computers. It's time for Floss Weekly, the show about free, libre, open source software. I am your host, Randall Schwartz, Merlin at Stonehenge.com, bringing you each week, or as often as I can do it, the movers, the shakers, the big projects, the little projects, projects you may be using every day and not aware of it, projects you may have never heard of and now want to go download immediately after the show. I know I do that every once in a while as well. Uh, joining me this week, uh, back by popular demand, Gareth Greenway. Welcome back to the show. Thanks, Randall. Thanks for having me. You know, it's been so long since we've talked. You, you don't call, you don't write. I know. So I, it, I've been I've been sequestered. I've been uh, in <laughs> deep in planning of a of a large event, and and they don't let me out. We'll talk a little bit about that at the end of the show, and we can give the uh, discount code one more time before I guess the the discounts or the uh, the the show is almost upon us anyway. Um, so we're you're speaking to us again from your uh, secret bunker in Thousand Oaks. My secret bunker, and yeah, some in uh, Southern California. Okay, cool, cool. We won't give the exact uh, latitude lounge to because we don't want uh, any ICBMs thrown at you there. And I am back, as you can see if you're watching the video, back in my P Portland apartment. And uh, this week, unlike two weeks ago, it's a gray sky out there, so hopefully there won't be any light traveling across my face. Uh, pretty crazy stuff that way. And I am just back from Cuba. And that's the reason I wasn't on the show last week. I have a little bit to say about that at the end of the show, including some props. I've got props with me, so we can actually see the whole thing. Um, and uh, let's see, uh, we, oh, uh, before I get started with the show, I do have a very, very special request because uh, the deadline's only a few days away. So if you're not watching this live stream or you watch the show within a couple of days, it won't matter. But I want to get nominated this year for podcast awards. So go to podcastawards.com. And I think the appropriate category is technical. So um, I think that's kind of the, uh, the, the, the thing I want you to, to suggest. I've been also uh, you know, putting on a Google Plus, stuff like that, because I really would like to win the technical category this year. I, I have, I've come close a couple times, but you, got, you guys got to nominate me first to actually even be on the ballot for voting. So, uh, yeah, cool, cool. So uh, uh, my, I already brought Gareth on. The project today is Kids on Computers. And Kids on Computers is a... Um, a, uh, a organization, a, a nonprofit organization, NGO, that's going around and trying to set up laboratories where kids can, uh, you know, kids that normally wouldn't have access to computers will have access to computers, even sometimes the internet, which is uh, pretty amazing when you consider that, you know, a lot of people don't have access to the internet in a lot of places. So it sounds like a really worthwhile project. Um, as I was going through the, the notes this morning, I noticed that uh, I actually have a connection in a couple of ways to kids and computers without realizing it. Uh, they got a grant from Linux Fund before I joined. Um, so I don't know how long ago that is. We'll have to ask uh, our our guest. Oh, I didn't even say the guest name yet. Uh, Avni Katri, uh, or Ka, uh, it's probably close. Um, anyway, um, and uh, also they uh, they have received uh, donations from Free Geek, which is in my hometown here, Portland. And uh, I think maybe David Mandel was probably uh, who's in common to both of those organizations. They probably had something to do with both of those. So anyway, good friend of mine. Uh, so uh, we'll bring Avni on in a couple of minutes. But uh, Gareth, what can you fill in? Um, so I've been following the project um, for a couple of years, and I've known Avni for. Um, a couple more years beyond that, um, but yeah, from from what I understand, it's a, it's a great organization. They're trying to get um, con computers running open source software into um, is that just me? into the countries where um, they they don't usually have access to them. Um, so it's I mean it's a great organization. Cool, cool. Well, without further ado, let's go ahead and bring on our guest, Avni Katri. We're, uh, welcome to the show. Hi, how are you doing? Thanks for having me today. Yeah, yeah. And where are you speaking to us from? I'm speaking from Boston. So we're just getting out of this big uh, nor'easter that we had this week. Um, so we're all shoveling and and um, trying to survive the snow. Yeah, I was 
was actually pretty fun to go to Cuba for a week, and uh, the weather there was like a constantly 70 and 80, getting away from these cold 20 and 30 and 40 that we're having here in Portland. So that was pretty cool. But this is not this week in weather or this week in geographic locations. It's this week in, no, it's not this week. I've done that before. It's Floss Weekly. So uh, why don't you give us the 30,000-foot view of what problem Kids on Computers solves and how it got started? So Kids on Computers um, was started in late 2008, early 2009, and it actually got started at um, the idea of, of KOC, um, Kids on Computers, got started at scale um, uh, back um, when a few of the um, attendees were like, well, wouldn't it be really cool to to set up computer labs in areas where kids don't have access to technology and, and install open source software on them. So they don't, you know, these poor areas, they don't have to pay licensing fees for software. Um, so it was started by three people, um, Stormy Peters, who's still a very active member and she's on our board, um, Raghavan Srinasaman and um, Dan, um, and I'm forgetting his last name, but um, they all um, got together. Dan pushed Stormy to like, hey, let's do this. And it, it kind of came to a fruition that way. And I joined about a year, a year and a half later. Um, and we started uh, with setting up labs in Mexico. And the idea was that um, we have strong local connections there. Stormy's dad was a professor at a university, a technical university down in Oaxaca, um, which is in the, in the Oaxapan region, UTM Oaxapan. Mm -hmm. And he um, knew a lot of local folks and he knew a lot of the local community and he was able to help identify schools for us. So Thomas like worked with the local community, said, you know, this is a really good school and got the community involved. They actually built the, the lab um, next to the school, like on the school grounds, like actually like put like construction, like the parents were doing construction to, to house the computers. And we had a, um, a FedEx grant at that time to ship these 30 desktops to Wahapan. And that, that's how our first lab came to be. And we installed Linux on them. We started out using Edubuntu. We've kind of migrated and tried different distributions since then. But our hope is really just to um, really provide access to technology and, and um, through that access to for education so that, you know, these kids and their communities can better their lives and, and better their communities. Wow, cool. Uh, now, if I were to walk, just make it a little more concrete, if I were to walk into one of these labs, what would I see? So you would see it, it depends on the lab. So we've, we, and we've transitioned quite a bit from uh, like doing desktops because we've moved toward laptops because one, they're easier to get through customs and even tablets now. So you'd walk in, you'd see um, uh, a requirement that the lab is secure. So you'd see a locked door with um, usually there are bars on windows with tables set up around the, um, the walls uh, with uh, computers on them, with laptops on them. Um, it, if the kids are there, you might see a group of kids using them. Usually they pair up, a pair or triple up, two to three per computer. Um, they're all excited. They're probably playing Tux Math or Tux um, Type um, <laughs> computers or um, a lot of, or you might even see a mom on the computer, <laughs> a mom who came in during the middle of the day who decided she needed to, um, you know, read uh, a little bit of offline at Wikipedia. So it, it really varies. It's really exciting. It's so exciting to see the lab set up, to teach um to teach the students and and um, see it actually come to fruition. Yeah. Is the training mostly one on one, or are there like classroom setups that would talk about something for a while, then go into the uh, go into the uh, actual lab area? So we this is that's actually one of the the toughest things that we work with. Like, how do we build a curriculum for for these students and and these teachers who themselves have not really ever used computers? So we work with the teachers on trying to help them build a curriculum. And I, in our ideal world, what we'd like is that all subject teachers are trained on using the computers and learning how they can leverage the technology and the content on the computers for um, like augmenting their, their traditional curriculum. Um, what happens when we go, we set up a lab, we usually have a couple of training sessions, group training sessions with teachers, and we show them like all the different applications, like Open Office, LibreOffice, um, you know, Khan Academy, um, Wikipedia, we, and all the games that are available. We, we train them on it 
um, several times. And then we'll do a couple of sessions with the students. And, um, and then after the lab setup is complete, we try to have a local contact, a local technical contact who's available to the school to help um, while, like after we leave. Um, and, and to also keep in communication with us. Um, so it's, it's, and that's a work in progress. Like right now we're working with UTM, we'll hop on to define a more structured curriculum and have UTM, um, the, the university help with training of the teachers so that there is like a, a quote unquote KOC certification, like you're a certified KOC computer teacher. Cool. And uh, I, a few years ago, we had the uh, sugar on a stick guy on the show program. And it sounds like you're running parallel courses down the same, trying to solve the same problems. Have you talked to the sugar people? Have you, have you considered using sugar on a stick so the kids could take it home if they have a home computer too? So sugar OS is the, it's the one that ran on OLPC. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. But it's, yeah, in, it's an so independent project now. Yeah, it was an independent project. No, we haven't talked to the sugar people. I know we talked to OLPC a while back. I think um, a couple of us had reached out. I think it was Stormy that had reached out and talked to OLPC, but it's um, our it, it for some reason I don't think I don't think we've explored sugar on a stick yet. So that's something we could look into. And it's really nice too because uh, it's you know the, the OLPC software is designed to teamwork really well. So you can have two kids sitting on two machines next to each other and they would see each other as icons and they could talk to each other and cooperate on things, uh, which I don't think would be very easy in an Ubuntu environment that if, unless it's something you're using lets it makes that easy. Um, like sharing, uh, can you explain that a little bit more? So sharing. Yeah. Um, so yeah. like, so like they would both see, for example, icons of each other and they could chat with each other and they could mm -hmm. both be looking at the same, uh, like, uh, you know, uh, uh, not squeak. What's what is it on the uh, on the OPC? Uh, some sort of small talk uh, available on there, and with tile-based programming, and they could both be looking at the same thing. And even though they're sitting next to each other on their own machines, I and see. the other advantage, the other advantage, sugar on a stick, is like I said, it's actually booting off of a USB key, and so all their work is in their hand when they walk away from it. And that That's means cool. if they find another PC somewhere, they can just plug it in and boot that again. So if they, like I said, if they have a PC at home, they can just carry their homework with them in their hand. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. No, right now it's um, the software is installed on the computer directly. Um, we do have local network set up for um, delivery of the, the large content because not all the laptops that we get are are um, big enough to store. Um, the, the content that we want to give the students, but we don't have anything where the students can work side by side on their own independent computers and see each other. Um, so that would be cool. Yeah, we'll definitely look at that. So one of the, the things I was I was thinking about while while you and Randall were were discussing um, kind of setting up these labs in in the remote locations, how do you handle uh, like support or like ongoing kind of um, if the machines need maintenance or if they have a problem or, or how, how do you, how do you set them up to be able to, do you, do you set them up to like, to take care of it yourself, take care of them themselves or, or how do you, how do you handle that situation? So we've evolved in the, in the way we do that. I mean, our primary and first, um, our, our first line of action is trying to have a local contact at each lab. Like uh, we set up three labs in Morocco in October and we worked with the Peace Corps to do that, right? So we, we had uh, Peace Corps volunteers in the region identified who are responsible for each lab and we have quarterly communications with them um, or we're trying to have quarterly communications with them. We had one um, just a month ago. Um, so we, we're in order to get get a status update on the lab and help them troubleshoot, um, because not it, it's very difficult to find expertise in Linux and expertise in open source um, in these remote areas. So um, we just look for an English like somebody who can who can communicate with us, an English speaking person ideally. Though we have a lot of Spanish speaking volunteers um, for the the Mexico lab. So that's our first line of defense, like having someone who's local who can communicate with us um, to, to tell us what's wrong. Um, the next thing like we're working on is improving the software and the install. So we went from, we started with Edubuntu, we went to Lubuntu, and now we're on, um, we're doing Ubermix deployments. Um, and there's an easy reset option on Ubermix. So we're, if, you know, when we have that local contact, they're like, you know, this computer is broken, this computer's not working, we can give them the reset command and they can at least get the computer back into the state so that the student can use it again. Um, and that's, right now, that's, that's our approach. Um, but it is one of the most challenging things because for some reason, like people, 
um, in these remote areas that are not comfortable emailing us or comfortable asking us questions. Um, and it's, it's, it's been a challenge. Um, so we're trying to get, we're trying to improve teacher skill level on one hand, trying to improve local communication with us and, um, and then trying to make the software easier to manage. So like a three prong approach. Cool. Um, so one of the, I mean, we mentioned OLPC a bit and there, there's a little bit of, of similarity, um, with what OLPC had tried to do and what, what you guys are trying to do. Um, one of the most interesting stories I, I heard about OLPC was where they sent a, a whole box of, of the, the, the laptops to a small village in Africa and they, they didn't open them. They just like left them in place and, and waited for like the villagers to kind of discover them and, and work it out for themselves. Have you guys seen something similar to that when you've deployed the labs? You've kind of like deployed the labs and, and stood back and just waited for to see what happened? Um, I I, th I thought that was so cool. I heard about, like I had read about that and I thought that was awesome. I was like, oh, that is so cool. Kids are amazing, right? They're just so amazing. Um, we, our usual experience is that as soon as we, um, it, as soon as we get the computers up and running, um, and it's actually varied. There are some people that are afraid. There are some students, some kids that are afraid. You know, they're like a little bit hesitant. They've never used a mouse before. A single click, double click concept is very new to them. And they don't understand like, okay, a double click will actually open up an application. A single click selects it. Um, but other times, like we'll have, um, it, it, and it works amazingly in pairs, but we'll have students, as soon as the computer is like on the table, they'll like start playing with it, try to turn it on. They'll find Tux Mat. They'll find any game that's on the computer that like brings them excitement and joy. They'll, they'll somehow find it. Like Mr. Potato Head is a favorite. Um, just learning how to use the mouse and being able to, you know, have good motor control. Um, so it's, 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 we've seen a huge variation. I think in some cases it works. And then some, I mean, in some cases, like they just pick it up on their own. In some cases, they need to be pushed or taught a little bit more. Um, and the other thing I've learned is that they learn from each other, right? So um, that's why the pairs and, and triplets work with each other. You'll, you'll have someone who's not as familiar with computers working with someone who is, and they really pick it up by just watching the other person or watching each other. And it's, it's really, really just, it's the, the excitement of being around them when they're like at the computer for the first time is like, an, it just makes all the work that goes into setting up a lab worth it. Once they have the labs in place, like how much um, freedom do they have to, to kind of install additional software? Is it pretty wide open or, or is it locked down to a point where they, what, what's installed by you guys is, is kind of what is there? So that, that question, that's a good question. And I think it varies, it varies upon a couple of things. It varies on the culture of where we are and it varies on internet connectivity. Um, so a lot of the schools where we are, actually I would say a majority of our 17, 16 or 17 labs um, don't have um, internet connectivity. Um, so them installing something is a moot point, right? Um, uh, they might, sometimes kids were, they're pretty clever, right? They'll get a CD or, or a USB stick from home and they'll bring it in with their favorite software. And it's probably like some application that works on windows and they'll try to like, try to install it on, on the machine. Um, or, uh, and, and, you know, that doesn't work, but, um, usually like if they don't have internet, usually there's no software installed for the schools that do have internet. Um, like in India, when we set up the, uh, the main lab that we have in Assam, um, we had internet connectivity the first couple of weeks we were there and the kids immediately went to Facebook, immediately went to, um, they're just going like they mentally started searching on Google. They started searching, you know, um, on just like popular sites. And you're like, well, how do you, how do you know about these? Like, how do you know about these sites? And they're like, oh, we go to the, you know, we go to the internet cafe down the street, you know, our parents let us go. And, um, so they, they know what's there. They don't, um, I don't think they're advanced enough to really, I don't think most of them are at least or familiar enough with computers to install software on their own. Or we haven't seen that um, even when there's an internet connectivity um, and permissioning wise, we don't lock it down yet though. We could be, could be more strict about it, but um, the teachers themselves are, are usually like, because for the teachers, this is an unknown thing too, right? They don't have a lot of experience with, with computers. And that's one thing I want to mention, like the kids are much more free and, willing to explore the, the computers and the teachers are a little bit more um, hesitant for some reason, right? They're a little bit more like, Oh, what's this? You know, let's be careful. Let's, let's like really keep like this treated as a treasure. And the kids are like the opposite. They're like, ah, we got to use it. So it's, 
it's a huge, huge variance. Um, but they, yeah, for the most part, we haven't had trouble with software um, downloads or. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, so one of the, the questions that kind of follow up questions for that is uh, for the, the locations that don't have uh, Internet access, how do you handle, say, like security updates for the software that's installed? Uh, we do it. So so our we do try to. So for our labs that we have, like our Mexico labs, we try to go back once a year and do an update on all of our labs. I mean, it's Mexico is becoming um, uh, like it's becoming more logistically challenging to manage like in a one week or even a two week trip because we have eight labs down there now, but we try to go to each single lab that we have run all the updates that we need to. Um, and we bring it, we bring install media. I mean, that's what we, yeah. So if they don't have internet, we bring install media and try to run the updates then. Um, and we, Mexico, we try to visit once a year. Most of our other labs we're trying to do once every other year. We don't want it to be a model where it's, uh, you know, you, you get the computer and we walk away. We, that's, we're very much trying to make sure what we have runs well. It's, we, we don't want it to be, oh, here's a computer. We're dumping it over the wall. Good luck. Like we're, we're trying to do the follow through the education aspect of it, the training aspect of it. And, um, you know, the upkeep as well. Okay. So uh, of all the places you, you guys have, have set up labs for, what location has been the most challenging and, and like what reason has it been the most challenging? I would say every every place has its unique challenges. Um, and I think that's one of the cool things about kids and computers is like we're, we're looking for areas where kids don't have access to technology. And I want to say like we are looking in the states as well. Um, like some uh, we have a couple of volunteers, Thomas, who's our main primary contact for Mexico. He's also looking at some Native American reservations in the Dakotas um, to identify just disadvantaged kids. Right. Um, so. Every like that, it is one of the cool things. Like every every place has different challenges. It's like you're, you're you're talking about learning a new like usually like language challenges, cultural challenges, like cultural norms, like what's expected there, um, and and then just the complexity of the project. Um, and I um, I can go into a little bit about each location if if that's interesting um, to folks. I don't know. Is that yeah? Is maybe that it's like one just one location, like an example sure. of like challenges you guys faced. Sure. So, um, why don't I do, um, so India, so we were in Assam, uh, this was back in 2013, November, 2013. Um, we're in Assam, we're setting up labs. We have a local volunteer there who is, um, to, he, he's from that region. His parents or his dad is still there. His sister and, um, her family is, is still in that region. So he was the one who provided us local contacts in that area. And he had, um, he has an uncle who is on a school committee there, but the, the town, um, Morigan or the district of Morigan, where the, the schools or the labs were going to be set up is about two and a half hours from the main um, city of Kohati in Assam. So it's the district of Morigan doesn't have running, um, doesn't have flushing toilets, doesn't have a- any of that, and it's it's two hours. So you know, with Thomas and I, Thomas, it was basically the trip. The volunteers that went were Vedanta, Thomas, and I. Vedanta is the one from that region, and we we decided that we're going to. Um, um, we were going to stay in Guwahati because Vedanta was like, no, you have to stay in a nice place. You know, you really, you really want to be stay, you know, in a in a hotel with flushing toilets. Really um, trust us. So we did. But then every day we were commuting, like we were in the van for four hours, <laughs> like two hours there, two hours back, and um, they, yeah. So I mean, there's just like, and it's it's a small community. They're so welcoming. Every single community is like so welcoming, but. For India, it was like logistical logistical challenges, and I think next time I would be comfortable actually staying in Morigaon. That's what I told. That's what I told Vedanta. Thomas and I both told him that we're going to stay in Morigaon because we don't want to do this travel on this winding mountainous road like four hours every day. Um, so that was that's been a challenge. I think other challenges like in Morocco. Um, I, I, I want to give this example because it's it's very culturally very different than the U.S. Um, they um, and very different from our other other locations as well. They teach uh, boys and girls separately. Like one of the boarding schools we're at, they teach boys and girls separately, and we had the lab placed in um, the girls' area, right? So it's been a challenge logistically to figure out. Well, how do we make time for the boys to come and make use of the computers? So 
a large part of our work, like there's a huge technical component of our work. And that happens usually before the trip. We're prepping, we're getting the software ready. And, and there are technical hurdles there too, right? Like making sure we have the right software. But a large part of our work is also work, like learning how to work with these different cultures, different communities, and talking to people. And um, so it's it's really enriching. And um, I don't know, it's, it's been, for me, it's been life-changing. So it's like, it's opened my eyes to like a whole new world. Hmm, that's interesting. Um, so how do you identify the locations where you're going to set up a lab? Uh, so that's that's a good question. And I think we have a set of criteria on our website, kidsoncomputers.org. Um, like if people are interested in setting up a lab in their area, like we have a certain set of criteria that we require. Um, you have to have a room where the computers can be locked. Um, there's a safe, like it's a safe location, like bars on the window. Um, you have to have a teacher uh, willing to um, teach computers, like somebody with enough computer knowledge or willing to learn enough computer knowledge um, to uh, to um, be able to run the class. And then ideally you'd have a local technical contact as well. So that that's our minimum requirements. And then if a school comes to us, sends us photos or somebody, a volunteer, it's usually a volunteer that brings us a school. Like a volunteer will go, hey, you know, I'm from this area. Um, I know this school, or this is a school I went to. We had a we have a new volunteer in Mexico who's who's doing that for a school in in Oaxaca City that we're about to vote on. Um, he's like, I went to this elementary school. My brother goes there. This is a great place. Um, here are photos. Um, this is uh, this is Gustavo. So he's he's like, you know, this would be great to have a lab here. And then the board votes on it. Um, we like examine the criteria. We discuss it in our monthly meeting, and um, we um, see like how are we going to get computers like. Um, and then we make it happen. So, cool. Hey, uh, of course, just when I'm about to ask my question, the uh, the stupid lawnmower shows up. <laughs> we did say that's one of the shows, but uh, so I'll probably have to cut back out over to you for for a second, Gareth. After I ask a couple of questions, I'm curious actually, um, uh, Avni, how much of your time is spent working with uh, kids on computers, and how much is spent? in what must be a day job, because I don't imagine kids on computers gives you a huge salary. No, actually, so our organization is all volunteer. So we're completely volunteer based. Um, and it's, um, so how much, I would say, um, so I'm currently president of the org, so I'm expected to give more of my time, I think, than, than most people. So I would say it, it varies depending on if a trip's coming up or if an event's coming up. Um, but about eight hours, I would, I would say it, it can really vary. It will be like between four, four to eight hours a week. Um, usually in the evenings. Yeah. And we have our monthly call and then there's all the prep work and then just keeping our site up, doing inventory management. I mean, there's a lot of like grind, like, you know, just management of logistics and, um, like looking at software, looking at what's the right, um, tools, like talking with potential partners and mm -hmm. then talking with local communities. And uh, how how many volunteers are currently working with you? Kind of rough count, I guess. So we have about twenty. I would say about twenty active volunteers, and then okay. we ha have about fifty people on the mailing list. Fifty or sixty people on the mailing list, I think. And I presume you have like an IRC chat for real time communication. We actually use Skype. <laughs> we have <a> <laughs> chat and Skype. Yeah, our um, one of our um, marketing leads, Corey, she set that up for us, which is really nice because people can just post questions and, and we'll answer it. So we use Skype right now for our IRC, which is interesting. So that's another thing. Our volunteers are really like very diverse. So we have like really technical people and then we have people who are really good at dealing with communities. Um, like they're a little bit older, they're like, you know, retired and they don't, they're not, you know, they're, they have never used IRC. Like if you mentioned IRC to them, they'd be like, what's that? You know, like, yep. like we, we understand phone. <laughs> so Skype has <laughs> been a good um, middle ground for us. Cool, cool. And um, uh, so what brought you uh, to be a, a KOC volunteer uh, at the beginning? I, you might have said it already, but I must have missed it. Okay. No, I don't think I did. So I, this is, it's like a really cool story, but um, I went to, um, so I went to the Grace Hopper conference. Um, so, uh, and I had met Stormy at scale, like I think a long time ago, like probably over 10 years ago now, but I went to the Grace Hopper conference back in 2000 eight or 2009, I think. And I, I reconnected with there. I was really inspired by the conference and I reconnected with Stormy there. And I, I was like, 
all happy and inspired after the conference. And, you know, I went on my own way. I was working at Yahoo at the time. So I went back to Yahoo and my manager at the time, he was like, you know, um, he had asked all the whole team, this whole team of 60 people, like, okay, plan your one year, um, you know, five year and 10 year goals, career goals. Like what are your five year, 10 goals? And in my, like when, and, and he had asked us this before the conference. So I went back after the conference and I looked at, at my goals and in the five year goal, um, column was setting up computer labs for, um, you know, kids in, um, you know, internationally, like that was just out of the blue. That was something I wanted to do. I hadn't talked to Stormy about kids on computers at all, you know, at the conference, but I went back and I, and I, I was inspired and I was like, you know, why do I have to wait five years to do this? Why can't I do Mm -hmm. this now? So Mm -hmm. I like searched online. I was like organizations that set up computer labs in, in poor countries or in areas where kids need help. And I saw kids on computers. I saw Stormy's name and association with it. And um, I was like, wait, I just, I just saw her at the conference. So I sent her an email <laughs> and it's like the rest is history. So I've been super involved for the last four years. And obviously got a lot of respect of your fellow volunteers to be elected to president of the organization for the last couple of years, right? Yes, thank you. Yeah, I hope so. And what's, what's the hardest part about being a president for an uh, organization of all volunteers? Um, I never, I always feel like we, we can be doing more. I, like, there's so much to do. There's, um, there's, so I, I have a hard time. Like, like I, I think I could give 40 hours a week to kids on computers. Like if, if, you know, if it was feasible I and mean, there's so much to do and there's such a huge need. Um, I mean, and I feel like we're really filling a big gap. So, um, that's probably the biggest thing. Apparently, a couple of people in our chat room have been Googling you while we've been on the show because he mentioned, oh, she's worked with Open ACS. Can you tell me yeah. what that is and uh, what your relationship is to that project? Sure. Um, so Open ACS is a, um, this is how I got started in open source, actually. Um, and why wow. I was at scale like back 10, is it 10 years, 11 years ago, probably. Um, but I, um, it's an open source, uh, framework for building community based websites. I would say it's like the precursor to Django is, is how I would frame it. Um, Mm -hmm. but it's, it's a strong community based, um, framework for, it's a toolkit for building, um, sites like photo.net. It it runs on it. Um, the, um, uh, it, it, it's just a web stack and it comes with user groups and permission, uh, user groups users groups and permissioning system out of the box mm-hmm. along with a suite of applications that you can install um, such as like forums uh, chat actually um, wiki um, and we use it at my current job at mass general we use it here um, though we were looking at potentially transitioning but i was on the leadership um, i was on the technical committee for a year i served mm. on the tech committee um, and then uh, actually like making commits i helped with a big accessibility project um, like making the toolkit accessible and, um, it has, um, I, I started using it when I was at UCLA, um, and it's, uh, it's very university based. So there's educational software, um, uh, that comes, uh, uh, that's built upon open ACS. Um, so there it's being used in universities in Vienna and Madrid. And, um, actually it was used, but initially it was used at MIT Sloan as well. So mm. Quite a few. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's a great toolkit. Um, it lets you get a lot done quickly. Um, though it's a little more obscure now. So going back to the, the kids on computers, um, discussion, uh, how do you, how do you acquire the computers? Like how do you get the one, the, the computers that you, you set up in the labs? Um, so that's, that's a great question. So we started, um, like we, we evaluate, um, so we, there's a couple of ways we do it. So we started out saying the idea behind it, um, that Stormy, Dan, and Sh- um, uh, Sh- uh, our, sorry, <laughs> um, Raghavan, sorry, his last name is Srinivasan. Raghavan came up with was like, you know, people in the U.S., after two or three years, they throw their, um, they not throw their computer away, but they're, you know, they're done using it and they get a new one or they recycle it. And these computers are relatively pretty good. These Windows, Mac computers, even Linux computers, they're relatively pretty good. Um, so why not ask people to donate to our org um, and, um, and essentially take those computers to these countries and... Um, and take and set them up. So we did that for a long time. I think as as we started scaling and getting bigger, we learned that one, when every computer in a lab is different, 
um, it's really hard to maintain. <laughs> it's like you, you have different, like um, there's different bio, like different BIOSes, different things. And it's, it's very hard to have a standard install that works on all the computers. So we even had a program through um, recycle, I think it was. Um, and I think it was, I, I don't see them on our site anymore, but I'm, I'm not remembering the name. And I know um, uh, we worked with an organization in Colorado um, that would, uh, give our, uh, give like people would donate computers to them and they would give them to us. We've also had cases where like banks would say, okay, there's like a set of 30 computers or set of 40 computers that you can have. They take the hard drive out. So we ended up with like LTSP installs and, and, um, doing interesting things, but, um, we would get the way we look at it is like, if it's a bulk donation, um, then it's, and, and all the computers are the same. That was, that's a better option, even if the computers are a little bit older. Um, and we had a set of computers donated from a school in LA. More recently, we've transitioned to looking for grants. We've received a few, um, well, Yahoo, or I think two Yahoo employee foundation grants, and we set up our labs in India with them. And what we'll do is we'll get, it's a grant for $5,000. So we go to India Vedanta found a local supplier and we set up computers. Um, we bought computers in country from a local vendor there um, for relatively cheap. It was like $250 or $270 per computer on a desktop. Um, so we didn't have to worry about shipping desktops or, you know, lugging laptops through customs. And that and that's worked great for us because the computers are all the same. They're new. Everything, you know, software just goes on much, much more easily. In Morocco, we did um, a hybrid model. We did one lab that was completely new computers with um, a grant that we received from, um, I believe it's uh, it's Randy, our vice president's company, United Way, and um, we did one lab with that, um, with uh, that with that those funds, and then another lab we we actually brought laptops through customs and the Peace Corps volunteer helped set up the papers and documents so we could get the laptops through easily. So it's, it's very, it's very, um, we're very flexible and fluid in the way, like we're a very organic group. So we're willing to like figure out a way to make things work. Um, whether it's old computers or new computers, um, the old computers, like we, we end up beating our head against the desk sometimes, which is really frustrating. <laughs> So one of the things that uh, while you were you were uh, talking about like the, the sources that you get the computers and you mentioned getting donations and and um, one of the things that I, I was thinking about was uh, one uh, one of the problems like a lot of groups in this in the United States face when receiving um, donated hardware is uh, there's the the, the forms and, and various like things you have to fill out saying you won't dump it into a, a dumping ground after a certain year because then the company is donating is responsible for like hazardous waste or something like that. Um, yeah. Is that something you guys face when you're taking these computers to other countries? Do they have similar um, issues like that? Yeah, it, that's a great concern. So we had that concern in Mexico um, because it was, it's one of the, it's one of the reasons we've had such a tough time getting old equipment through Mexico. They're like, we don't want Mexico to be a dumping ground for old, old equipment. Like, what are you doing with these computers? And we would even have letters from like officials um, in, in like we drew at, at like the state level and it was still difficult. So we definitely run into that problem. Um, we haven't encountered anyone telling us absolutely no. It's usually like we either pay a, a fee to get the computer, like we pay a fee to the government to get the older equipment through, or we try to work with government officials and show them that, you know, that we're legitimate org trying to do legitimate things and that we're responsible for the computers. Um, okay. Um, so shifting gears a bit, you will be presenting a, a, a talk at scale, correct? Yes. Yes. Yeah. I'm so excited. We're having a summit, a Kids on Computer Summit. So this is our first, um, it's our first event uh, that I, yeah, it's our first event where we're not all, well, the volunteers are going to meet up because we're a very distributed group. We're international, right? We have people and volunteers in Mexico, Boston, Colorado, California, Texas, um, Pennsylvania. So we were very distributed and we never get to see each other except, um, we, except on lab trips, like when we're setting up a lab. So this is our first event where we're actually going to get to hang out with each other, see each other and not have the additional like logistics and stress of like, okay, we're trying to work with the local community and set up like three labs. And so it's super exciting. So we're going to have a couple of events and one of them is a talk about, 
um, you know, enabling education through technology, which I'm super excited about. Yeah. And it's going to be a panel of, I think it's going to be five, five or six volunteers, depending on who's getting visas and who's able to come. Can, can you talk a bit about what, what, like if anyone's listening and anyone, like if that sounds interesting to anyone, um, what they would expect going to um, that panel, what they can expect to hear? Uh, so they will hear um, from each volunteer, they'll hear about their personal experiences, about like what it's like for them to go on a trip, like what, what it's like for them to volunteer with kids on computers and be part of an open source organization um, and making an impact in, in people's lives. Like I never imagined four years ago that I would be um, do, like traveling to Morocco, India, Mexico on a regular basis to, to help set up these labs um, and, and meeting like so many people trying to speak broken Spanish, um, practicing broken Hindi um, and broken French in Morocco. I mean, I just like, it's, it's so amazing. Like it's, um, I, I think you'll just get to hear about our experiences um, setting up the labs, get to hear about um, what the organization's all about. Um, and, um, and we'd love to have, if anybody's interested in joining us, we, and joining us on a trip, however you, or even if you want to help without coming on a trip, we have lots of opportunities. So we're just excited to share our stories and, and, um, talk about uh, the, um, talk about the work that we're doing and, and how we're trying to change, um, kids lives for better. Hey, uh, I know you're just about out of time. Uh, we have to get, uh, we, you, you need to get away. So I want to make sure that we've covered everything you wanted to cover. Is there anything that we've left out of this conversation so far that you want to make sure our audience is aware of? No, just uh, come see us at scale. If, if you're there, we'll have a booth as well. So come, come see us. And, um, and thank you so much for, for having me on the show. I'm super excited to, to be here. Well, it's been wonderful. I, I hope to, I'll see you in person at, down there at the show because I'll be at scale as well. So I'm pretty awesome. sure Garrett's going to be there. <laughs> I might stop by. I might stop by. <laughs> stop by. <laughs> All right, great, great. Thank you for being on the show. Uh, this is this has been um, Avni Khatri, uh, uh, who uh, represents the Kids on Computers project. Um, what do you what do you think, Gareth? Uh, it's a great organization. I, I'm excited to that we finally. I, I'm personally excited that we finally got them um, to have a, a presence at scale because um, I, I I like inviting groups like this because it exposes more people to it and gets gets the word out of, of the great work that they're doing. So I'm, I'm really excited to to see them at scale. And I'm, I'm just excited that, that more people will know about the group. Yeah, the summit looks like a really good thing. I'll have to definitely drop by that. Do you know what day that's on? I think that is going to be on, it's either Thursday or Friday. Great. I'll be coming in around uh, 10 a.m. on Thursday. So that'll be uh, wonderful to uh, go check out. So uh, early in the show, I mentioned Sugar Labs, so the Sugar on a Stick project and stuff. And uh, I, I went back and Googled, and it turns out that that was in show 134. So if you go to twit.tv slash floss134, uh, we had Walter Bender, who was representing that project, and sugarlabs.org is their website. When I hit that site, it said, it doesn't come up. And I went, uh-oh, are they out of business? What's going on here? But uh, they, they had an IRC channel listed on uh, the wiki page, uh, the main Wikipedia page for Sugar Labs. And I joined that chat room, and I said, so is sugarlabs.org gone? And they, and they go, no, 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 it just got some server problems. Don't worry. So don't all rush to there right now on the live stream because it's it's down right now. But probably by the time you hear this, if you're hearing it in the normal podcast feed, uh, but I think there'll be a lot of overlap there. I think the, there's some good concepts there. So I'm hoping that uh, that maybe there's some collaboration, cooperation. I mean, maybe they'll run the standard Linux distro, but people can have sugar on a stick and use those cooperative programs and those uh, sort of kid-friendly, game-oriented mostly. But it's like playing with games is always a good way to get started, but learning to program that game uh, without too, uh, too steep of a curve is really a great thing to have. And I know the Sugar also has standard web browsers and things like that too, so they could go and hit Wikipedia or they could hit, uh, you know, Facebook or whatever they want to using this, this little software there. So uh, hopefully there'll be some uh, collaboration there. So hopefully I will have facilitated that. Uh, anything else before we move on, Gareth? Nope. Okay, great. So we do have some upcoming guests. I have been furiously sending email out to try to fill the schedule. And for the next three weeks, at least, it's full, which is great. We just added to the schedule, I think, four new guests. Um, we have the Krita project, which is a digital painting and illustration application. It came out of the work of, uh, I've got to put the name in front of me, but um, 
uh, putting the cute toolkit on top of GIMP to actually make it look decent. Uh, sorry for the people who work on GIMP. It, it actually caused a, f a bit of a fury in the uh, in the GIMP community. So anyway, they've been working uh, to build this thing that looks really, really amazing. There's even an OS 10 version of it, so I'll have to check that out. Uh, we also added uh, Geo Paparazzi, which almost says what it means. It's a very fast qualitative engineering and for geologic surveys. And it's also a great way to get your own, you know, uh, track data when you want to, uh, you know, figure out where you've been, like like I did all last week when I was in Cuba to have my pictures geotagged. Uh, it's also great for adding elements to OpenStreetMap. So if you're into doing uh, ge geologic surveys or OpenStreetMap or uh, just GPS tracking, you're going to want to check that show out. Uh, three weeks from now, we've got Sogo. Uh, which is groupware server with a focus on scalability and open standards. Uh, also, that was that's been on the schedule for a little while. We've also just added it's about six or seven weeks out. Mohid, Mohid, M O H I D, and it's a water modeling system. So you can basically program in, uh, you know, how what what your uh, your surface area looks like, and then you can w water flow down in it, and it's really fast and smart. So you can get real time. Uh, Water simulations, that sounds like a lot of fun. Hopefully we'll get some good graphics on that as well. Uh, on a very, very short list, two, com two groups have said, I will, I'm will. i picking a date now, but they haven't actually picked a date, and that's the people that write the NTP software. That's the network time protocol that actually keeps all of our systems uh, synchronized up with the, uh, the international standard time. Uh, we also have Docker coming back, uh, hopefully. Although, again, waiting for them to pick a date that they might cancel again. Of course, I hope they're listening to this. Then they're probably going to be mad that I said that. But anyway, uh, you've, you've heard me talk about Docker three or four times a year. Uh, and the time wings on the schedule. We do have uh, the big list of who's upcoming uh, is always on the schedule. at That is linked from twit.tv slash floss. Uh, that's the homepage for this show. And if you go to where it says uh, look for upcoming guest list, uh, I, I'm going to put out the request again. If you have a project that you would like to see on Floss Weekly, please email the project lead or chief representative or whatever, and let them email me, Merlin at Stonehenge.com. That provides the least uh, gra gravity, I guess, like water going downhill. Yeah, that provides the least, uh, the least friction. That's what I was looking for, friction, which is the thing that slows the water down. Um, uh, for getting these things out and on the schedule. So please do that. Um, you can follow us at Floss Weekly on Google Plus, or we're also at Floss Weekly on Twitter. Everything gets echoed over there, at least a link to it does. We do have a live chat. We took a couple of questions from chat today. Uh, we're at normally at 8.30 a.m. Pacific time on Wednesdays, the earliest show on the Twitter network. Uh, and you can go there. If you go to the uh, live.twit.tv, you can actually see a link to get into our chat room. There's also an IRC uh, mirror of it. Uh, that's how I usually watch it. So it's going that way. Uh, you can follow me personally, Merlin, M E R L Y N, at, uh, uh, but more often I'm just posting things not to Twitter, but to Google. I'm Randall L. Schwartz over there. So, as I said at the top of the show, I'm back from Cuba. It was an amazing trip. Uh, there are new rules for tourists that just went into effect. Uh, and I, we, were, we were under the new rules. So even though this trip has been planned for a year and it had very special regulations and requirements and they would report us to some government if we didn't go to every one of the events that was planned to this people-to-people -people, uh, inter interaction, uh, there was new rules. The nice thing about the new rules is, where is it? Here's my prop. This is an actual Cuban cigar that I got to bring back on, in my bag. And in fact, when I got to customs, they said, you know, because I wrote down two Cuban cigars. Well, so I do have two. Two, two Cuban cigars, right? Okay, so um, uh, I, I declared that, of course, on my customs form. And uh, they said, you know, just last week, if you had done that, we, we confiscated. We got a lot of Cuban cigars in, our, in, the, in the back room. <laughs> I said, wow. So good timing for that. Uh, I, I need to go back to Cuba, too. It's just been beautiful. The, the other thing that's really weird, more props, is they have a $3 bill. So they don't have a $2 bill. They have a uh, – can't see that. Uh, uh, there we go. Oh, that's right. It doesn't focus closer. Okay, so it's three dollar bills. So they spend those there all the time. Uh, let's see. And what else do I have? I also have some music. I brought back some Cuban music. Okay, just Cuban music CD. So you don't have video on this particular section of the show. You're not going to make a lot of sense of that. I'm describing everything as well, though. Um, I also got to see Buena Vista Social Club, which you might remember from the movie. The movie was made with a group of people, some of which unfortunately passed away now. But the head uh, percussionist, the guy that was in the uh, upper right-hand side of the picture when they were playing, uh, uh, and Amadito Valdez is still in the band. And so he's probably like 90 now or whatever. But uh, so I got to see the original, two of the original guys were actually still in the band. Of course, the rest of it sort of rotated to younger people. That was a lot of fun, about an hour with them. Um, the reason you didn't see many posts from me last week is the internet there is all via satellite. 
And if you've ever been on a cruise ship and you know there's a two second lag and, and there's uh, and, and it's really slow and it's really expensive and I had to pay a lot of money just to get a couple of hours of time and only at hotels. Uh, hopefully that'll get all straightened up. The problem, of course, is that the closest landfall is the U.S. So they can't run cables to the U.S. until last week. And so they only they can only and going the other way goes across the, the uh, trench. So that's really really difficult to do. So that's why we've had horrible internet there. Uh, there are, uh, a bunch of people set up a dark net, which was sort of cool. There's like there's like six thousand people that belong to this dark net, so they can play World of Warcraft against each other and things like that. They're not actually on the internet, but they're sort of like all tied together via cables and and uh, Wi-Fi and all sorts of stuff. So it's been been pretty fun. As I said, I got to meet a lot of good NGOs and NGO government partners are all doing really great things. And of course, the final thing I'll say about Cuba is there's lots of old cars, really, really old cars from the 50s and 60s. And they're prized because everything else that's there is like either Russian made or, or now they're importing some Chinese uh, vehicles and things like that. So, uh, but the cars are beautiful. A lot of them are being used as taxis so you could get a ride in an old car like that. And they're very proud of their, your cars. They have a name for them. They call them Yank Tanks which I thought was cute, yank tanks. Um, so that's all, that's all I'll say about Cuba. Uh, uh, I might say some more in, in the next show or something because I might, might have thought of something that I didn't say this time. Uh, I will be at scale in February uh, along with uh, our guest and Gareth. Uh, I will also be in New York City in late March uh, because I have uh, a cruise and going out of Miami and I have some friends in New York City that I want to go visit. So, um, no, a cruise going out of Tampa, but that's still close enough. All in the same area. Uh, so watch again my, uh, my, uh, uh, the, um, the, uh, uh, watch my, my tweets because they come from my Google Plus, which is where I probably talk about where I'm going to be and, and when. Probably set up a meetup in New York City because I'm going to be there for, for a full week. So, um, uh, I think that's all I want to plug this time. Uh, and, uh, I bet I know what you want to plug Gareth. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to plug scale. Um, obviously big surprise there. Um, so scale is the Southern California Linux expo for anyone that doesn't know it's happening, uh, February 19th through the 22nd at the Hilton LAX in uh, Los Angeles, California. Um, so anyone listening that wants to escape the impending snowstorms come to California, we, we had a, bit, a little bit of rain yesterday, so I'm not saying it'll be beautiful weather, but certainly better than, than some of the storms around the country. <laughs> it's true, uh, it's true. Although so it might be the it, one week a month it'll actually rain in Southern California. It's entirely possible. It has happened before. Yes, yes. And uh, do you, are you still offering that discount code for our listeners? Yeah. So the, the, uh, for anyone using the, the code FLOSS, they'll get a 50% discount off a, a full access price. Um, so that gives them uh, access to all the talks on on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, as well as our our expo halls um, and and the whole basically the whole show. Um, so regular price is seventy dollars with the discount; it's thirty five. Um, so it's a, it's a really good deal. Absolutely, absolutely. It's I look forward to it every year that I can that it doesn't conflict with a cruise or something for me. So uh, and this week, this time it doesn't. I'll just simply already be in Southern California, so I'll just simply. Uh, Uber my way over to the uh, LAX airport. Uh, Hilton? No. Hilton? At the Hilton no. LAX. Yep. Hil Hilton LAX. Okay, great, great. Cool. Well, uh, Gareth, thank you once again for stepping in at the last minute, helping me out and helping me get a guest and, and for co-hosting. Yep. Thanks for having me. Always glad to do it. Awesome. Awesome. So it's that time again. We'll see you next week on Floss Weekly.